Climate change is getting bad right now, but I can think of an easy way to make it worse. What if, just for funsies, we gathered every last crumb of coal, oil, and gas, put it all in a big pile in the desert, and had the world's biggest burning man? Cooked it all till there's nothing left, toasting marshmallows over the toxic smoke and breathing in all that sweet, sweet CO2. What would this do to the climate? How bad would it really be? The short answer is pretty damn bad. But in this video, let's address the long answer and see just how Earth would respond to this once in a lifetime festival. So we can finally answer the question, what if we burned all the world's fossil fuels? Okay, before we get too deep into this thought experiment, let's set some ground rules on how our bonfire is gonna take place. In true festival style, we'll burn the fossil fuels over three days, with the lineup being gas on day one, oil on day two, and coal on day three. And yes, I realize that it would probably take more than a day to burn all of it, but let's just pretend we've got godlike powers to burn it all in an hour and spread it to every corner of the earth. Also, no partial combustion. And since it's happening so quickly, we're gonna assume the ocean doesn't absorb any CO2 till the end. And lastly, all our estimates for how much we've got to burn will come from conservative estimates of world reserves. While there's probably way more coal, oil, and gas that we haven't discovered yet, the bonfire's happening right now, and we don't have time to- Wait, they got the torch lit! Day one is about to start. A fireball double the size of London erupts from the desert, sending columns of fire tens of miles into the sky. I hope you're standing far enough back, because it just got really hot really fast. We just burnt 131 billion tons of natural gas. Assuming the energy from about 34,000 Sarbama nukes didn't just fry the entire planet, how much CO2 did we just emit? For each ton of methane we burnt, it generated about 2.75 tons of CO2, meaning we just dumped 361 billion tons of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, raising the levels from 425 ppm to 472, an 11% increase. This extra CO2 is enough to raise the Earth's average temperature to about 1.9 degrees C above pre-industrial temperatures. So what's going to happen to Earth? Now that the average temperature is 1.9 degrees C hotter, we've pushed Earth's climate past a couple of tipping points. But what does that mean exactly? If you want a thorough answer to this, I've made a whole series that you can watch with the link down below. But simply put, it's when the Earth's average temperature becomes too warm for a certain system to exist as it once did. The 1.9 C of warming is no laughing matter, and the first things to go are the ice sheets. The Greenland ice sheet, a massive chunk of ice three times the size of Texas and over three kilometers deep at its thickest, has started to rapidly melt in the warmer air. The snow falling on it can no longer keep up with its melting, and it has most likely crossed over its estimated tipping point of 1.7 to 2.3 degrees C. If left to its own devices, it will melt entirely, eventually raising sea level by over 7 meters. But Greenland isn't the only place affected. The Thwaites Glacier, also known by its friendly nickname the Doomsday Glacier, has crossed its tipping point too. With over 1.5 degrees C of warming, the melting of this glacier can no longer be stopped, and it too will join the Greenland ice sheet in the deep ocean. This glacier falling would be the first domino to fall among all the glaciers that make up the West Antarctic ice sheet. If this whole network melted away, it would eventually raise sea levels by another 3 meters. And of course, melting ice sheets means melting permafrost. The frozen soil found mostly in Canada and Russia is now thawing, slowly releasing tons of carbon that was stored underground in a deep freeze. As more melts, more carbon is released, heating the planet further and melting more permafrost, a positive feedback loop that has now been set in motion. But enough about the poles, the coral reefs aren't doing too hot either. Well, actually, they're doing real hot, and that's a problem. After our first day, most of the tropics are now too hot for corals to thrive. Iconic coral reefs like those in Hawaii, the Great Barrier Reef, and Indonesia are all on track for permanent bleaching. Marine heat waves in an acidic ocean means that these fish nurseries are doomed to disappear, meaning the livelihoods and source of protein for nearly 1 billion people will soon disappear with them. And thus, day one ends, with some pretty bad damage to our poles and tropics. But we're not even halfway through the festival yet. A pyramid of over 1.6 trillion oil barrels stretches beyond the horizon, the air above it wavy and brown from the noxious fumes. You watch as someone throws a torch, the fire spreading from barrel to barrel like a chain reaction. Thick black smoke fills the air around you, blocking out the sun, and you remember your safety training. Put your gas mask on first before helping others around you. 
The fire rages. The smell of sulfur and asphalt burns into your nose as 222 billion tons of oil goes up in flames. Since each ton of oil produces about 3.15 tons of CO2, we're looking at a fresh delivery of about 698 billion tons of CO2 into the atmosphere. After our day one festivities, the new atmosphere concentration is up to 561 ppm, a 32% increase from today's levels. This is enough to warm the Earth by a staggering 2.8 degrees C above pre-industrial temperatures, which is seriously bad news for us. First off, all the things that day one caused just got twice as bad. The Greenland ice sheet and Thwaites glacier are melting twice as fast, permafrost in the Siberian tundra is disintegrating, and unless some coral was set up shop in New Zealand overnight, they are becoming a relic of the past. But now some new ecosystems have also crossed over their tipping points. The first ecosystem is the Sahel region in Africa. This belt of land between the forests and deserts gets nearly all its water from the West African monsoon, fueled by evaporation coming off the Atlantic Ocean. Thanks to all this new heat, the evaporation fueling these monsoons has now been supercharged, which is shifting the trajectory of these storms northward, closer to the desert. Surprisingly, this means that areas once devoid of plants will now have more water, leading to a relative greening of the Sahara and northward expansion of the Sahel. But of course, just because it's greener here doesn't mean it's greener everywhere. As the Sahel expands northward, so too does the desert, encroaching on the coastline of North Africa and exerting its effect on Europe too, reaching as far north as France. But this isn't the only monsoon system that's changing. The Indian summer monsoon is fueled just like the West African monsoon, with lots of summer evaporation causing heavy rains. Under a warmer climate, the land is expected to warm faster than the ocean, leading to a stronger pressure gradient between the two and intensifying the monsoons. Thanks to our little festival, the South Asian monsoon season is now stronger than ever, causing widespread damage to farms, cities, and overburdened infrastructure. But going back to Greenland for a second, something interesting is happening underwater. And by interesting, I mean globally catastrophic. All the freshwater melting into the ocean is seriously messing with the currents in this region, specifically the Atlantic Meridional Overturning Circulation, or AMOC. Compared to saltwater, this melting ice is less dense and tends to float on top of the ocean instead of sinking into the deep Atlantic and driving global ocean circulation. This is causing the AMOC to wither and weaken, with unforeseen consequences on the global ocean. Given enough time, it won't be able to sustain itself and could stop entirely, causing much drier, colder conditions for nearly all of Europe. The last area I want to focus on are the world's forests, specifically the boreal forests and the Amazon rainforest. The boreal forests, the largest ecosystem on Earth, are incredibly well adapted to survive in the cold where few other plants can't. As this near polar region warms, which is happening twice as fast as the global average, the cold resistant trees will be exposed to warmer, drier weather than they were once used to. This will lead to not only a slow die off of the trees and increased risk of wildfires, but also force the boreal biome to accommodate new plants, animals, and pests, hurting the balance of this ecosystem. And since the boreal forests make up 30% of the world's forests, losing them means a bunch more carbon being pumped into the atmosphere. While 2.8 degrees C is not likely to completely wipe out the boreal forest, it will be the beginning of the end for this ecosystem. But what about the Amazon? Well, this heat, along with deforestation, is drying out the rainforest. Since so much of the Amazon rain comes directly from the trees themselves, as parts wither and die, it means less rain, which in turn causes more trees to wither. This unfortunately means that parts of the Amazon, especially the periphery, will slowly become a savanna, losing their capacity to sustain all the biodiversity they once did. With our 2.8 degrees C of warming, the Amazon will lose about 66% of its forest cover. Okay, so the monsoons are screwed up, the ocean is screwed up, and the forests are screwed up. But hey, things could be worse, right? <laughs> Let's just say we saved the best for last. Bring on day three. The air is still hazy and orange when you see it in front of you, a pile of coal taller than Mount Everest, weighing over one trillion tons. A haze of black dust hangs around the base like a dense fog as the MC chucks the third and final torch. Within seconds, the fire spreads across the miles of coal, a choking black smoke full of soot and metal billowing into the stratosphere. I hope you've got a comfortable gas mask, because this will hang around for many months. You also notice the air getting stuffier 
The coal fire is consuming so much oxygen that the global atmospheric concentrations are starting to drop a few tenths of a percentage. Not enough to asphyxiate everyone at the festival, but it's slowly getting harder to take a deep breath. But the main thing making the air stuffy are the roughly 2.5 trillion tons of CO2 we just pumped into the air, enough to raise CO2 levels by another 324 ppm to a grand total of 885 parts per million, more than double when we started. While the global temperature would probably be cooled by all the soot, the end result of our fossil festival would lead to about 6 degrees C of warming. This is apocalyptic. At this point, nothing looks the way it should. Glaciers in the Himalayas, Greenland, and Antarctica are sliding away, filling the ocean. The combined losses of these glaciers melting entirely could raise sea levels by as much as 50 meters by the time all said and done. This submerges nearly all of southern Bangladesh, Mumbai, Bangkok, and Shanghai in Asia. In North America, cities like Manhattan, Washington DC, New Orleans, and San Francisco are lost forever, along with most of Florida and the Yucatan Peninsula. The Amazon Basin and Buenos Aires are completely flooded, along with Lagos, the Nile Delta, and swaths of Western Africa. The Netherlands, Venice, London, and Northern Germany are on the chopping block as well. And any low-lying island nation like Kiribati, the Maldives, and Tuvalu go entirely underwater. The ocean isn't just rising though, it's also acidifying. As the ocean takes up about 30% of the world's carbon dioxide, the concentration of carbonic acid in it goes up as well. This new CO2 could lower ocean pH by another 0.3 to 0.4 units once it comes to an equilibrium. This means less calcifying organisms like oysters, clams, urchins, and certain plankton, disrupting the marine food chain and leading to mass extinctions. Oh, and any coral that might still be hanging on at this point is slowly dissolving away. Lastly, all these changes we've seen, the permafrost melting, the forest dying, and the waters warming, are releasing huge amounts of carbon into the air, meaning that our CO2 levels are still rising. This isn't even coming from fossil fuels anymore, we burn them all. This is methane released from frozen permafrost, carbon stored in the trees and soil going up in smoke, dissolved CO2 in the ocean bubbling out as it gets warmer. We've set off a chain reaction of feedback loops that can't be stopped anymore. The CO2 will keep rising for decades, even though we've burned every last bit of fossil fuels. The earth we once knew is gone, replaced by this hot, flooded, acidic, unstable, and unpredictable mess of a climate. You know, I'll be the first to admit that maybe our festival might have been a bad idea. Now, obviously, this is an extreme hypothetical, which hopefully won't ever play out. But the takeaway here is that our future now lies somewhere in between today's climate and this imaginary apocalypse. Every year we delay a sustainable transition, every year we prioritize complacency over progress, every year we knowingly harm the only planet known to sustain life pushes us all closer to what we just saw. But on the flip side, every bit of incremental improvement, every bit of fossil fuel we keep underground, every bit of camaraderie that guides us towards a carbon neutral future pushes us all further from this nightmare of a climate breakdown. The signs are clear, the evidence is overwhelming, and governments around the world are failing egregiously to answer the call. It is now up to us to take this fight into our own hands, and come together, despite our differences, to usher in a better future for all humans yet to be. Thanks for sticking around to the end. As always, all the sources are linked down below. If you learned something from this, enjoyed this, or just want to see more climate science on YouTube, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe to support Planet Zero. I'll see you next time.